Thank you, Dr. Shea, so much for speaking to us at Simple and Practical Mental Health. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, oh, thanks. I must congratulate you on the recent publication of your wonderful book on psychiatric interviewing, the third edition. Um, oh, it, it's really big, uh, a masterpiece, uh, classic in the field. Um, uh, it is a remarkable achievement, I must say. Oh, thank you. So let's start, Dr. Shea, by asking, you know, why is the topic of psychiatric interviewing so important? Um, because in today's day and age, you know, there is a trend towards a checklist approach towards diagnosis, filling out forms. Yeah. Um, you know, it seems like psychiatric interviewing, is it a dying art? Okay, uh, great question. Uh, hopefully it's not. I think there's a risk that clinicians might not be as good at doing it as they used to. Uh, and I think that's something that we really want to reverse that. I actually think we can generate clinicians who are better than they've ever been. Um, and, and by the way, I also just, I just wanted to thank you again for inviting me to come on here and your gracious comments and uh, sure, I, they're sure. truly appreciated, but Absolutely. so let me get down to the, the interview itself, why it's so important. Um, uh, obviously, the bottom line is we can't help anybody unless we have a good idea of what is going on with them, both, by the way, health-wise, their wellness, but also the problems that they're dealing with. We clearly have to come up with a sound differential diagnosis as psychiatrists. And, you know, one thing that we found is, is that we've gotten better and better at developing evidence-based treatment modalities for specific diagnoses. So I would argue that makes interviewing even more important than it was. And then also the other thing that uh, sometimes I think people forget is that the bottom line, whether it's psychotherapy uh, or medication use, we can come up with the best treatment plan in the world. If the patient does not want to do it, it is a foolish treatment plan. You have to come up with a treatment plan that the patient wants to do. And what makes the patient want to do a treatment plan is that they like us, trust us, and feel comfortable with us. So I would argue, Raj, that uh, interviewing is of immense importance in the therapeutic follow-through for our patients, uh, for instance, with our medications. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the book. I talk about a thing called the medication interest model. But so in all of those respects, interviewing is very important. What's also exciting to me is, is that I really do think that how we teach and train younger clinicians, but then also how we ourselves use interviewing techniques um, is really undergoing an evolution, almost a revolution. And so let me just describe that. When I was uh, uh, first being trained uh, back in the Civil War, uh, <laughs> wasn't the Civil War but anyway, um, I was basically taught interviewing by people telling me principles. It might be you need to engage your uh, patient very well, uh, or you need to dig to uncover difficult or sensitive material. Those principles are excellent. Uh, and they help us to understand why we're interviewing, when we might want to try something. But principles alone have a big problem to them. They don't tell you how to do it. Yeah. And yeah. so what we found in training clinicians, but also in taking experienced clinicians, when they read a book like I'm talking about or I've written, one of the beauties of this is every principle that I would ever talk about, I always say, here's a way to do it. And here are a variety of ways to do it. I'll give you an example. You could have a, um, here's a great principle that all of us as experienced clinicians, uh, your viewers, are, are, I'm sure would endorse, which is before we want to raise a taboo topic with a, a patient, whether it's substance abuse, suicide, drinking, or, uh, uh, incest, domestic violence, we want to make sure or meta-communicate to the uh, patient that it's safe to talk about this thing. Right. That's a great interviewing principle. Right. But it doesn't tell you how to do it. Right. And it gives you no choices. Whereas now we've developed things where we change those principles to techniques. And then if we put techniques together, we have a, a strategy. I might turn and say, here's two techniques for doing this. Uh, the first one is called normalization. So to meta-communicate to that person, they can talk about suicide. I might turn to them deeper into the interview and I might say, um, you know, Mary, uh, some of my patients who are going through as difficult a depression as you're experiencing, yeah. they tell me that they sometimes find themselves having thoughts of killing themselves. And I'm wondering if that's something that you've experienced. And boom, you're in. 
you've normalized it for the person that right. they, you've meta communicated a safe to talk about this because I've told them I've spoken to other people about it. She's not the only but think one about this. There's another way to meta communicate that it's safe to talk about a taboo topic. I could turn to the same patient and I may make this choice. I'd say, um, Mary, with everything that you've been going through, have you been having any thoughts of killing yourself? Uh, and once again, I've meta communicated it's safe to talk about this because I've told her I I get it. I get the intensity of your pain. I could understand why you'd have these thoughts. Right, right. Now I want to show you something even a little bit uh, different about that. Um, and let me use an analogy with this. I think all of uh, your viewers uh, are well aware that what you and I do, when we have 50 minutes to do an initial intake, it's an extraordinary challenge. It's really difficult uh, to do. <coughs> and so one of the things um, that I personally believe is that what you and I do in our interviews, it's more complex than any piece of surgery for the same amount of time. So true. And if you think about it, surgeons are really thinking about what they're doing. They're intentionally making decisions. If a surgeon's cutting and she uh, is using the McMurphy uh, strategy or technique, if it doesn't work because of a problem, perhaps in the anatomy of that patient, she switches gears and she makes she says to herself, I'm switching to the Thompson technique. It makes a difference to her. Right. When, when a surgeon turns and says, I want an eight blade, they don't want a nine blade. They want an eight blade because the eight blade says something ever so different. Now, let me tie right. that back to what I was just saying. That technique called shame attenuation, where I communicate that it's safe to talk to me about this taboo topic. Um, I gave you this example of it. Uh, with everything that you've been going through, have you been having any thoughts of killing yourself? Um, watch a slightly different uh, style of shame attenuation. I could say, with all of your pain, have you been having any thoughts of killing yourself? You notice the first one I cued off of their stress. The yeah. second one I cued off of their pain. Now, let me show you why you might use one or the other. Uh, many of us, when we're interviewing patients, whether in a community mental health centers, private practices, inpatient units, a lot of patients come to us because, uh, and they will, when we say what's going on, they will list a variety of intense stressors. They right. just lost their house. They're in a horrible divorce. Uh, their spouse has developed cancer. There's numerous. And if the patient shows us that what they are most upset about is their stress, that a really nice way to do that is to turn to them and say, with everything you've been going through, have you been having any thoughts of killing yourself? Because, you know, you're trying to get a person who might really, really want to kill themselves to share that secret. It is hard to do. They have to really feel you're safe to share this with. Yeah. Let's take a different patient. We're working in a community mental health center. We're picking up a new person with severe paranoid schizophrenia that they've been dealing with for 15 years. Um, this thing has devastated their lives. And the pain and the thing that is driving them to suicide is not a specific stress. It's the pain of this illness, how it has devastated their lives. With that patient, if I want to raise the topic of suicide, I might choose to say, instead of with everything you're going through, I might say, Jim, with all of your pain, have you been having any thoughts of killing yourself? And that resonates with them because they know yeah. I get it. Yeah. Schizophrenia has caused me great pain. But you know what, Raj? I just demonstrated the difference between an eight blade and a nine blade. Yeah. Yeah. I would argue that this is what we can do. We can move interviewing to a spot of uber sophistication where when we're trying to raise extremely difficult things, that you're a perpetrator of domestic violence, right. that you're having suicidal thoughts, uh, or uh, the issue that perhaps at some level you've been a victim of incest, all these very, very difficult. There are techniques, and those techniques can vary in how effective they'll be with a different patient. Uh, and that's sort of what it's all about. Right. And this stuff is teachable and trainable. Terrific. And I, I think that I think that when you uh, uh, give these techniques certain names and provide yeah. a, a menu of techniques, many of which we can pick from, it actually makes the right. training easier. So the rather than saying, oh, you need 20 years of experience before you can learn these techniques, you know, you have made it easier for for us to learn these techniques by 
giving them a particular name, giving examples and giving, showing us, de demonstrating them in your video uh, recordings. What, what Absolutely. Another thing about that for, you know, many of your viewers, uh, I'm sure many of them do train other clinicians and, and hopefully, you know, that's one of the main things this book could be great for. But for the experienced clinicians reading this book just for themselves, one of the things that also that you discover is, uh, or at least I've discovered as an experienced clinician is, is that there are things that I've done and there's things that all of your viewers do that they might even do some of the things that I was just describing, but they had no name for it. It was not operationalized in their mind. So it's harder to use it intentionally. Right. Um, so once you say to yourself, oh, yeah, I've done that, but now I know when I'm doing it and I can pick and choose with a guy with a stressor, do I use the one shame attenuation or the guy with a chronic schizophrenia, do I use the other? It opens up tremendous flexibility by giving experienced clinicians a real map an understanding of the immense repertoire that we have as experienced clinicians. So we can be better at intentionally deciding what we want to use when, okay. which I might add something is that in the days of, uh, you know, the time pressures today are so extraordinary and the electronic uh, medical records uh, the demands of, of trying to get this done as rapidly as possible. Actually, it's one of the reasons why these approaching interviewing not just as principles but techniques the techniques allow us to work as fast as possible to get the information that we need uh, and they allow us to move with rapidity yet still have tremendous sensitivity while we're interviewing our people all of that makes doing the electronic medical record that much easier because the data is more organized in our heads to begin with we've gotten the data quicker we have more time etc etc so that's a terrific point. So you're saying instead of the time pressure being um, an impediment to good interviewing, rather the time pressure makes it necessary for us to be focused and skillful and know intentionally what we are doing and go after certain pieces of information in an organized manner. Absolutely. And, and the art of this, and for those of, uh, viewers who do train other uh, younger clinicians, etc., uh, part of the art of this that's so important is the idea that I really do believe that even though uh, we have tremendous time pressures, that the idea that we have to garner this information does not mean that we use a checklist approach. Uh, the bottom, Because the problem with that is, is that if the person doesn't like us and feel engaged with us, you might ask them all the stuff on your checklist, they won't give you the truth. So uh, that, that's a worthless endeavor. Right. I am convinced that by using intentionally specific interviewing techniques, specific strategies, we can garner stuff very rapidly and actually in a remarkably sensitive fashion. Those two shame attenuations I uh, demonstrated a little bit earlier, they're extremely engaging with people. There's another technique, for instance, that we talk about that if you're um, trying to explore an area, maybe you're trying to explore depression. And the client spins off or the patient spins off and says something like, yeah, I'm, um, uh, I'm a little bit concerned because I'm drinking more at night uh, to knock myself out because of my sleep problems. You know, you do it. You, maybe you were exploring neurovegetative symptoms of depression and sleep. Okay. Now, one of the problems would be is I think if you slip out of there and then immediately ask them in great detail their drug and alcohol history, you may never get back to finish your exploration of their depression. It's a very easy thing to do. But watch how effective we can structure this interview time-wise. I might turn to that uh, patient, Raj, and I say, well, that really sounds like a real concern. I'm going to want to come back to that in a little bit about the drinking. I still want to get a better idea of just how bad this depression is disrupting your sleep. And then I finish exploring their major depth right. to make sure I'm comfortable that that's what's going on and maybe that's not a part of a bipolar process. But in other words, I finish that part of the differential. Now, notice something. There's a technique that I talk about in the book uh, that's, I, I think, very simple, but when intentionally used is very powerful, which is we call them a referred gate. In other words, one way to get into a topic is to refer to the fact that it was mentioned earlier in the interview. Right. So imagine if I turn to that patient after I've done that, I haven't wandered into the drug and alcohol history. I've finished and I've got a good differential on their depressive or mood symptoms. Deeper into the interview, I turn to them, Raj, and I say, well, you know, Mary, a little bit earlier, you were mentioning that you had some concerns uh, about your drinking again. I really want to find out more about those concerns now. Terrific. Now what's happened is, look, that's a structuring technique. Yes. But if you think about it, 
I think it's powerfully engaging because it is meta communicating something to this client or patient. That you are listening. I was really listening to you. I heard what you said was important earlier. I remembered it. I'm coming back to it. Fantastic. This is a simple technique to employ. I use it all the time. I would say that in my, my interviews, that's probably 30 or 40 percent of my gates or transitions are referred gates to something that the patient had just spontaneously mentioned earlier, uh, etc. All teachable. All teachable. Terrific. So, so Dr. Shea, this, you, you're so right that specifically we really need to learn and then to teach to others specific interviewing techniques so that we can get valid information in a focused way, in a time efficient and organized way. So in our next video, I would like to turn to talking about how to assess suicidal ideation. Oh, okay, great.